Winstead. I'm a microbiology major, and I focus on culturing the algae spirulina in inside the lab, utilizing landfill leaching. So I first want to introduce you to spirulina. Um, the cultures we have in the lab, um, I fondly refer to them as the spaghetti noodles because spirulina has many different um, shapes. You can usually have a helical spiral form that's very well known, um, very pretty pictures. Uh, the cultures we have ongoing in the lab, they're kind of like this S shape. And as we'll later see, um, they are filamentous and you can actually see the tendrils usually growing up the flask. So it's very easy to see how they are filamentous in nature. So spirulina, filamentous algae, um, it's a blue-green algae. So if you saw in the uh, lab, the cultures, uh, especially the original noculum, kind of has this slightly blue-green tint. You may have heard about blue-green algae recently because we had that toxic bloom down south. So I think that's gotten people in news thinking about like, oh, what is this algae? Where does it come from? Spirulina is not so dangerous. <laughs> it's not for these toxins. It is actually uh, a health food. like. Uh, we just, just all added, we just added it. Mm -hmm. Like you just ate it, those pills. It has a high nutrient content and it's marketed, you know, as for health, um, protein, but it's low calorie, so it's very much liked um, people who like protein. So here is a picture I took with the microscope that really shows um, the filamentous nature. Um, it's a bunch of individual trichomes that replicate and just keep going longer and longer. So I sometimes find strands, you know, I'll find a super long strand that goes way past the microscope, came and see it all in the scope, and right next to it will just be a little bitty spirulina, so mm. it can grow very long. And here is a culture, one of mine, and you can see on the side, you know, the filamentous nature, it'll slowly creep up the flask. So as I cultured my spirulina in lab, every day I would kind of have to look at it and shake it to make sure the spirulina was all down in the solution. So some of the advantages of um, growing spirulina is that it does tolerate high pH. Other algae, you know, they like the neutrals, um, like certain microalgae, like we talked about the fish, you know, they like the nice neutral pH. Spirulina actually, you know, almost prefers higher pHs because it outcompetes other algae. You know, it can, the cultures I have growing, they've gone anywhere from pH of nine to all the way up to 12, and they seem to be doing very well at those high pHs. Um, as mentioned, they are filamentous, and that's significant because filamentous algae um, tend to be easier to harvest. Like you saw in the previous picture, you can visibly see it, you can like scrape it, um, and it's easy to obtain. And as also mentioned, you know, microalgae have very tough cell walls, and so much algae can easily be broken up. So it's easy to use for future applications. Something special about the spirulina is that since it is relatively well known, marketed as a health food, we already have the commercial technology to cultivate spirulina. You know, it's happening in real life, like right now, like people are growing it, it's being marketed, it's being dried, it's being sold, so. And yeah. harvested. Mm -hmm. And harvested. So bringing up the idea of using this, as we'll see to grow on landfill leachate, isn't like a crazy idea. People will be like, oh, spirulina, think of that. So now introducing what is landfill leachate. Landfill leachate is the liquid, liquid waste generated by landfills. It contains inorganic and organic constituents. And what basically happens is that, you know, rainfall or water precipitates through municipal solid waste landfills and it collects all the nutrients and chemicals in the landfill. And with landfills with bottom liners, you know, all this water pools down, it pulls to the bottom, and now we have this extra waste. Um, what's unfortunate with landfills is that, you know, we visited a closed landfill for OUC, or not for OUC, we visited the closed landfill, um, the Southwest Archer landfill. We visited OUC. We did visit OUC. Yeah. Um, you know, this landfill is being closed, um, closed like in 1999. However, it's still producing leachate, you know, and there's um, regulations in place that say, you know, they have to keep maintaining landfills after they're closed for up to like 30 years, or however long it's still producing leachate. And as described, it's kind of a problem because landfill leachate is relatively toxic. This is due to high ammonia content, and I'll talk about later, it's pretty bad to have high ammonia escaping into the environment. And this also contributes to limitations in what we can even do with it. You know, it's high ammonia, relatively toxic, you know, ammonia, if you have aquariums, ammonia is very bad for fish. It also has variations in pH. Um, younger landfills tend to be more acidic and have a little less ammonia. But as it ages, uh, the pH increases, become more alkaline, and the ammonia increases. So 
it's one solution you may have for one landfill, say, oh yeah, we finally built the system, so you have this landfill over here, well now you have this landfill over here, it can be totally different, because it totally depends on what's in the landfill, where, what's the climate, precipitation, all that affects the type of leachate you'll get, and as well the quantity. Also, leachate is a relatively dark color, um, and this makes it difficult if you want to grow algae, because algae, you know, requires sunlight, you need to photosynthesize, and if the leachate is dark, it reduces the light penetration. So like I said, it's pretty bad if anything with nutrients, you know, high amount of nutrients gets into the water. It can cause eutrophication and groundwater contamination. So you know, as we've talked about down south, the toxic algal bloom, you know, it you know, covers the water and it kills the native inhabitants. So as you can see here, you know, algae, if leachate gets into the water, um, algae will coat it and it'll reduce the oxygen in the water, and it'll kill off just everything in the pond. So it's very important that we prevent landfill leachate from escaping without being treated. As well as we do not want it in our groundwater. Like I said, landfill leachate can contain who knows what. You know, we were putting back guano in our leachate, you know, high nitrogen. We don't want those toxic compounds escaping into our groundwater. Food waste. So food waste, yep. And we don't want it to escape into our groundwater because then we have to, the waste water management people have to deal with it and work harder to try to purify the water for us to drink. So my research objective was to basically utilize the nutrients from the Southwest Archer landfill and to see if we can go spirulina and a lap setup. So my methods were, um, I did everything in triplicate, as we said, statistical significance. We used um, a 20% inoculum from an actively growing culture we had available in the lab. And I used, I had tested 5% landfill leachate without sodium bicarbonate and 5% leachate with sodium bicarbonate and 10% with and without sodium bicarbonate. Um, just a little background, sodium bicarbonate is a common additive to spirulina medium and it basically you know, increases the pH, makes it more alkaline because spirulina likes alkaline pHs, um, stabilizes it and also acts as a source of carbon. Um, and my active culture was 100 milliliters, and I basically had it on a rotating tray you saw in the lab. It continuously rotates at about 110 RPMs, and it underwent a 24-hour photo period. Usually, you generally you want light and dark reactions, so you have times where you shut off the light for different photosynthetic, photosynthetic reactions. But the spirulina that was being cultivated in the lab that I used for inoculum was used to 24-hour photo period, so I just continued with my experiment keeping it on 24-hour photo period. So methods where I acted every day I monitored the pH and the optical density. The optical density was the main way I helped to monitor growth because I started off the inoculum. Um, it is relatively clear, inoculate with algae, and as it grows, it gets more dense, and the density can correlate to the biomass. I then established a correlation between optical density and dry biomass yield in order to predict the final weights. And I, I also characterized the leachate to basically have an understanding of what am I feeding my spirulina, and you know, what is in this leachate. So, just some general characterizations of the leachate. Like I previously mentioned, this is from the Southwest Archer Landfill. It's closed. The pH was a little bit of above neutral, slightly alkaline, or, um, and the alkalinity actually was um, fairly high. It had relatively high ammonia levels, and as you can see, it, most of it was soluble, like most of the organic and carbon um, was available in the solution, which makes sense because leachate is mostly liquid, so I expected it to be mostly soluble. Um, very, very low total solids. So. It was kind of weird having centrifuging a liquid to see the solids. Um, and the optical density was relatively low, which I was surprised at because, like I said, leachate, it varies the color, you know, it can be like light or dark brown. So the landfill leachate I started with was actually relatively light, almost like a golden color. It's like tea? Like a, yeah, like a tea. tea. It actually, over time, it did darken. So like I said, the properties of leachate are very variable. So these were my final results. Um, this, the y-axis was the optical density, and this was the time and days I took each reading. Um, the top line was the spirulina medium, so that was the spirulina grown with the best possible medium I can provide. And the green line represents a 5% landfill leachate with 1% sodium bicarbonate. And this was just 5% landfill leachate. So as you can see, the 
5% with an only 1% sodium bicarbonate did very well and was able to keep up with the medium relatively closely. Now, 10%, I was especially... But I, because I think the other thing is that uh, even with the 5% without the bicarb, right? Yeah. Was, like it's 1.1 as opposed to 2, so you've got 60%, you've got 60 of the yield on the 5% as you got with the spray lean medium. Yeah, so like while the, while the additional bicarbonate um, helped it grow more, it was interesting because only, it's only 5%, 5% added. So, I mean, this this is, you know, spirulina medium specifically designed to help it grow. Expensive. And only 5% land for leachate, it was still able to have some growth. The 10% is where we see the um, land for leachate with 1% bicarbonate very closely kept up with the control. Unlike the 5%, though, which, as you can see, you know, it was able to grow, the 10% did not fare so well and slowly dropped off. Um, the theories behind this is that, you know, we talked about landfill leachate does have high ammonia, and with the ammonia content, it could have overwhelmed the spirulina, and it just wasn't able to adapt well enough. However, like I said, it's interesting, with only addition of 1% bicarbonate, <coughs> it was able to keep up and it was able to adapt. And like, like I said, this is, this is medium specifically designed for growth, and we're only using very low dilutions of leachate that can help it to grow very similar. So do you think we should recommend to Earthrise Farms that they should use 5% leachate to grow their spirulina rather than buying commercial fertilizer? I think they definitely should. They probably want to consider growing it specifically at their location to see how it fares, because temperatures, precipitation can all affect because like I said, this was an in-lab experiment, so I tried to control it. It's very well controlled, but outside can be unpredictable. Okay, and Maria will be talking about that later. Thank you. And so this is just a visual representation showing um, the final dry biomass yield um, using the different mediums. So you know, the spirulina medium did the best. However, the 5% and 10% with bicarbonate were right behind it. So that's pretty much the point to drive home. You know, we're spending all this money on uh, commercial fertilizers, you know, we're having to mine for it when we have this leachate where, you know, we, we don't want this leachate. Well, we like not to have the, yeah, you're right. Yeah, we, we don't want it, we, we don't want have, it. We have this leachate and it's generally considered a waste and a nuisance, you know, we, like, oh my goodness, like, we have to treat it, you know, we're required by law. But instead of treating it as a nuisance, we can utilize, utilize it as a potential resource. It's kind of like a win-win. You know, we have this leachate, we can't really do anything with it besides just treat it and put it back in the landfill. Well, hey, you can use this waste to help grow more biomass for spirulina. So, conclusions: basically, you know, we can utilize landfill leachate as um, a nutrient source for spirulina, and it, it is possible, and it helps displace. You know, we don't have to always use other commercial fertilizers. Like we have this material, we're producing it anyway. We might as well utilize it for some good.